and uh, many of his friends. I mean, the um, achievement, the, the average age has suddenly risen. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is exactly the very first uh, lecture, the inaugural lecture of this academic year, Martin Center Seminar. So oh, you're, really? you're the, the very first one. Well, um, so we're delighted to be here. Um, just to remind the audience for those who do not know who is Ed Oskin, so that Ed um, was first did dentistry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Long time ago. Not sure if you are a fully qualified dentist. But oh, yeah. Are you? Yeah. 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 Anybody yeah. has a concern? My, <laughs> my teeth are evident sorted. Yeah. Oh, they still there. Oh, they still there. <laughs> but then, then you did your, you did your BA here yeah. and, and even your diploma. Yeah. That's from the whole of the 60s, isn't it? So yes, pretty much. Pretty, pretty much, so you were around here most of the 60s. Um, and then, the, as we remember, we had this event last year, the, the 50th anniversary of the Martin Center. In 67, the creation of the Martin Center, so you, you were around. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then there was the um, uh, new start <coughs> um, quite quickly. You start yeah. um, ARC, yeah. like you said, right. yeah, yeah. Um, and then you, um, this becomes something something else, GDS, or, and then, uh, and then McDonald Douglas, you expect oh, no, that. Like we sold the company. That's right. And then you be became immensely rich and retired. <laughs> and retired <laughs> and and in the south of France, as one does. That's as one does, exactly. And, and we are, uh, we're all very jealous, but you're, it's very noble of you to come back. I don't say this is serious memory, I think. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, Ed, would you like to join me? Sure. Thank you very much. Please welcome Ed Oscar. one of the very earliest spin-off companies in, in, in Cambridge. Here we are. This is uh, the, the, the date. And Marcia Lechen even part is, uh, is up here. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. But this is a section of uh, the first version of the Cambridge phenomenon. And, uh, <coughs> so we were pretty early on the stage. And it was, uh, and it was great. Uh, we started by making computer software for designing hospitals. Later, we productized the software and uh, we uh, uh, started selling it commercially. 
version of the Latin world. Uh, we were waiting, we waiting for two major clients, the Department of Health and Social Security and the Oxford Regional Health Authority. Later, as I said, we made, made the system into the products, uh, one we called BDS, or Building Design System, and the other one was GDS later, General Transport System. So, by 85, we were pretty dominant in the AEC market here. Uh, and we were producing systems that clearly could cope with major projects. And that was really important. Um, and we widened the scope of GDS to from architect engineering and construction to GIS and so on. And the, the, my bit of the story ends in 1985 when we sold the company to McDonald's. Uh, I'm going to go back to the beginning there now. This is the computer we were using first of all. This is uh, the Atlas computer in, which was uh, just off the Manning Road. Uh, it, <coughs> it took about five or six times the size of this room. And this was our work, first workstations with a, a, a graphics tube with pretty advanced there. Uh, and a, a, a teleprinter uh, and a telephone line to the computer. And this was the uh, next computer we bought, which uh, I had to, had to guarantee with a mortgage on my house. <laughs> but apart from that, it was all right. Anyway, this gives a picture here of uh, these two initial projects on Atlas. And then we got. <coughs> many computers and uh, started really developing things rather better. The OXA system and the BDS system were in parallel. There was a major relational database capability called EROS. And then after that, having failed to sell BDS, uh, I'll explain that later, uh, we went, went on to GDS, which was a, apparently a 2D drafting system. And then we Got, in, got into various modeling procedures after that. Uh, so this is about Harvard. Uh, a man called Howard Goodman, who was the chief architect of the Department of Health and Social Security, came to Lubbs one day, and he did actually say, I want to die in a hospital. He actually said that. And when you think about the date, 1970, that was pretty hairy. He, he, thought he, would, he thought he could have a CAD system. He thought he could actually interact with it. And he thought he could get things big enough and complicated enough to deal with the most difficult, one of the most difficult building types possible. And, and he really believed it. And he backed us to try to do it for him, which is great. <coughs> so what did we do for him? Uh, the DHSS at that time uh, thought they could need, had a need to build 50 large district general hospitals. District general hospitals then, then was between 500 and 1,000 beds. That's a fairly big hospital. Uh, and they had on the cards, if the Treasury had allowed them, 50 of these to do. And they, uh, they decided that they could pre-designed the departments of hospitals. But what they wanted to do uh, with them is to put them together in sensible ways. So uh, what happened was they, they made these departments in a 15 meter square checkerboard pattern uh, with, they were meant to be low rise, relatively low rise, with big deep interstitial voids to give natural lighting and ventilation. So a complex hospital from a just a list of departments could be built from these pre-designed departments. And there they are. And you suddenly realize how big they are. But this 144-bed <coughs> ward uh, is about 100 meters long. So it's a big bit of building. And they had, they had pre-designed departments for different purposes. There's lots of other uh, different uh, that was the scale of the thing. And we did three things for them. We built uh, a thing that was called Shep, a thing that was called Hat Bay, and a thing that was called Tram. Shep basically allowed the designers to put together
together these departments in the way they wanted to and test them out. So uh, we had, they, this is in 70, this must have been 72. Uh, they had floor plans, they had cut and fill calculations. I'll show you the amazing line printer column, column of beam plans, heat loss analysis, cost analysis based on the components they were using, traffic analysis uh, between departments, a few different perspectives and so on. Uh, and they were able to cross compare different alternatives and say, test one against the other. And this sort of this is one of, one of the one of the hospital. This is the sort of measurements that we got out of it, and they're in it says at the bottom in thousands of square meters. So anyway, um, and then with those components and with those estimates, you got a rough guess of total cost. It's a very cheap hospital. Look, 1.7 million only. <laughs> But that, I don't think that included the inside of the hospital, it included the structures and the, and the outside. Anyway, that, that was good. Uh, but these are the sort of results. And this we were doing, we're printing out layouts of these things on the line printer uh, at, the, at the CAD centre. And you can see here, this is the thing that's the hardest, which is the linking corridor between all the departments. And that's why it was called hardest. And so we could draw perspective. That, that was pretty good of the day. And you can see it's a low rise, deep institutionaloid operation. And uh, we even, which I think was pretty good, got computers to make the model. Which uh, I think Stan does now without even thinking about it. But for, for, for 72, that was not too bad. Anyway, the next problem was to, to say, where should the departments be? Instead of the designer saying, oh, I've made the decision, uh, let's see if we can get the computer to make better decisions. Didn't work very well, actually. But, uh, so you had a brief here. <coughs> Entrance, outpatients, ITU, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and when they were going to be built, and so on and so forth. And these are restraints on, this is going to go on the ground floor, and this has a special link, and so on and so forth. And the computer put together the departments around the harness. Uh, and uh, it, it made a fair fist of it, I think, but it wasn't great. But the thing that interested me most was the traffic and activity model, which is actually straight old love stuff. Uh, we were very fortunate that a wonderful lady called Janet Garnett, or Janet Tomlinson as she was then, and she developed a knowledge-based mechanism where you could write plain English and the computer would read it and interpret it for <coughs> to give operational policies for the hospital departments. And that was, that was very interesting. Uh, and so from that, you could get uh, trip data uh, uh, within the hospital every 15 minutes of the day, and you divide it up by staff grade, the urgency, the scale of the thing, how many trolleys were moving, and so on and so forth. And this was, this was the plain language data input of, of hospital department uh, policies. And out came a matrix like this, which is fine. And then here, you can see more what was going on. This is 24 hour day, meal trolleys leave after dinner, uh, part time staff leaving, main visiting period, so things like that. And that gave the circulation pattern for a particular department. Uh, throughout the hospital. The powers that be didn't like it, because one of the things it did was it compared the viability of the brief that they'd set. So it said, oh, the surgical department's way 
too big and the this this is the ITU is much too small and things like that. So these guys who had uh, commitments to their department, they said, how the hell can a kid have told me that? We're over providing or under providing. So that, that's, that uh, was uh, in, interesting, but it cut against the grain of the individual requirements. So this project sustained ARC uh, with money from the DHSS for about four years. And then we got to the serious stuff. Uh, this is OXIS, but it's, uh, the CAD system for Oxford Method. And they had a very detailed computer system, uh, building system, which was designed specifically to provide hospital-type environments. Uh, now, Paul here took a summer off and went and worked for the East Anglian Regional Health Authority with uh, the then deputy architect, a chap called Malcolm Jones. I haven't been able to find him. I don't know where he is. Uh, I hope he's still with us. Uh, anyway, this was to set up a, a, an equipment scheduling system for hospitals. And what's really interesting to me about it, in, especially in the light of the future of the current BIM and so on, it was the this project set the tone for almost everything we did afterwards. And it was the data, not just the graphics, which was really important. And that set the tone for almost everything we did thereafter. Um, <coughs> it had no planning preconceptions, and it was a, available uh, to build a, a wide range of health buildings. It would have built a harness hospital, but uh, there, was, there was an interesting uh, uh, dichotomy between the Department of Health, who were going in one direction, and the Oxford Regional Health Authority, who were going in another direction. So we, we had to ride both horses. But this is the sort of scale of detail that they were working at for us as a method. And you can see the, stru the structure, uh, the services, the fitting out, and so on and so forth. And <coughs> this was a, a very detailed and very comprehensive system building approach. So what we tried to do was to write a computer system, was to integrate all the stations design, and to sh shift the application of design resources from production documentation, sitting at drawing boards, drawing things, to uh, spending more time thinking. Uh, perhaps it was uh, provided a, a better considered design decisions than with the, with the professional capability that was available. This is what the building description contained. The, it had a thing called the codex, which was a database of components. But one of the important things it had was not just physical components, which are things, but it also had abstract specification components as well. And you could build a hospital brief or a brief for a building uh, with, the, with the run data uh, of different sorts and so on. And then in 3D, we overlaid zones, not just departments and rooms, but things like fire zones and uh, load-bearing zones and so on and so forth. And then finally, in order to get together and do the... Uh, do the general arrangement drawing, there were three dimensional locations <coughs> of physical components. And this gives you an idea of the contents of the codex. This is the descriptions of steel steelwork. Uh, and I, I was very, very fortunate that I don't know how, but we've got some great programming people <laughs> in ARC. They were unbelievable. There's one of them there. <laughs> so we, we were unbelievably fortunate in the talent that we, I don't know how we attracted it, but we did. Uh, but they enabled us to write the 
descriptions which were self-describing and so on and so forth. It, it was a very, very kind of, th this is what we thought about, this is what we thought a component looked like, or a component assembly looked like. You know, this is a wash basin, but with the drains and the supplies all there, and you could check in three dimensions, <coughs> like conflicts between those and, and other things that they were not meant to conflict with. And so you had a, a, all sorts of uh, data, which was basically three dimensional data, but just pictures on the sides of boxes. So to develop the building file, we Um, briefing was abstract, sketch design was 3D volumetric, uh, comparative analysis, cost, uh, environmental costs, and so on and so forth. But detail design was positioning physical component boxes in that 3D space. And uh, <coughs> the production documentation was extraction of uh, drawn data from, the, from those uh, from the building combination of the codex and the building file. This is the sort of sketch design out there, just subdivision of rooms and a three-dimensional assessment of it. This is Milton Keynes District General Hospital, and that, that was wholly built with, with, with the boxes. Uh, so we had measurement, hidden loss, lighting, etc. etc. And checks whether it was viable in Oxford methods. So if we could say, oh, <coughs> let's do that, because we can't build it with Oxford methods, which is quite cute. And this is Norman Keynes District General Hospital. That was t totally built and designed with, with Oxford. Yeah. And one of the things that drops out of the bottom of all that is that it's very easy, for example, to uh, produce a drawing of a four bed wall and all the room elevations quite automatically. So you could, you could uh, just say, go and draw the room elevations of this department. You could just do it. But the other side of the drawing was that it was, uh, um, had a lot of data associated with everything. So you had where found catalogs and, and, uh, and, and all sorts of schedules. Sanitary equipment schedules or whatever else. They all came up, fell out of the bottom of the building, building description. But OXIS itself was really meant to automate the putting together of these components in 3D. So, given the choice of where you wanted the columns to be, it would lay out the horizontal structure and it would design it and produce the documentation <coughs> of steel fabrication. Um, and there's other things, the cladding, the slabs, so on and so forth. And, and, so on. and uh, Paul, this doesn't look very exciting, but this is actually very exciting. Because this is, this is Paul's automatic design of ductwork and ventilation systems in Oxford Methods. Now, this, this was incredibly capable when you think about it. Because it checked whether the ducts would go through the structure and whether, whether they clash or not and where they had to be. You know. Anyway, was, and then it showed her everything out, of course. But uh, it, it was, he said it was the best thing he'd ever done. Uh, and I think he was right. But it was never seriously used, sadly. Because one of the problems we had was that the logic underneath the building system could change. They changed the modular, modular coordination and uh, it, it just wasn't sufficiently stable for, for, the, for this thing to work, which is bad. So, what do we do? <coughs> we threw away all, all we, we put on one side all the stuff that was specific to option method and made a thing called and selected out a thing called BDS or building design system. So it still had an integrated database, it still had the briefing, it still had the sketch design capability, <coughs> but it had no automated assembly. And that was potentially an important advantage in, in the original office. And it was limited to orthogonal geometry, uh, which is okay, but it didn't really work for us. This is the schedule that we had. The same 
brief shaping of it, outline design, uh, analysis, detail of design, it was basically putting three dimensional boxes together and then uh, scheduling and drawing and general, and general range of drawings going up the bottom. Now, I put this here just for a very nice memory. This is Bill Mitchell putting together King's College Chapel in BDS. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you know Bill Mitchell, but I think he, he died a long time ago now, very sadly. One great guy, and uh, he, he, uh, he, he was a very good friend of mine. Anyway, and then we started putting together uh, test buildings in, in BDS, and inevitably it was full of full of uh, lavatories and showers and God knows what else. section as well as plan and so on and so forth. And we even tried to design nuclear power stations once. But there was another company doing that rather better. It was called CIS and the CAD Centre. And they they really went to town on very, very good uh, work on the uh, on pipeline design. But the interesting thing is that even for a bog standard system system building from for building shed. Even then, BDS didn't really work. So, just the sections are right. Oh, it looks like I've used out the slide. I didn't put it there. No, it, doesn't. Anyway, it doesn't do roofs very well. So, we had some really short coming. 3D dimension box geology didn't really work. Uh, it depended, the BDS depended on creation and maintenance of large quantities of predefined data. Now, what's interesting now is 40 years later, the manuf manufacturers of components for buildings provide that 3D uh, component data. It, it, you had to make it yourself before that. Uh, or, 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 you know. And really, there was no tradition of building the building twice once, once modern in a computer, and then once again on site. It was just it just didn't jar. Anyway, the, the guy, a chap called Dick Darcy, who worked for the Regional Health Authority <coughs> in 1977, said BDS representing the system architects and engineers should need, not what they want, nor what they can use in practice. So, so we uh, had to go off on another route. Uh, and we still had the we had problems with people uh, trying, to, trying to use BDS to, to, to do architectural design. And uh, <coughs> they, the uh, general range of drawing, although they were marginally annotated, didn't really do the job. And so uh, we thought it would be a good idea to have a simpler 2D system which would be much more flexible, and that was called BDS. And we started off trying to edit the drawings, the, B, the general range of drawings that BDS had produced. But that went by the wayside in about three weeks. Uh, it was very, very quickly overtaken. So we were producing a simple drawing system in 2D, limited number of commands, easy at editing and update, but for the time, absolutely superb graphics. And uh, as Paul said, that freedom at last. This is, this is some of the original test drawings. That, the one, th this one from Japan was done by a good friend of mine called Masanori Nakashima. He came, I got a phone call one day from Nick Negroponte. And he said, the best student I've ever had is mad. He wants to work for you. And, uh, uh, and he came because he was fascinated by the three-dimensional modeling and building description that we got going in, in, in Oxford. But uh, anyway, he got him converted to GDS at the end, and so he's coming up. Um, so he would do any architectural drawing that he wanted. It, it also worked very well for maps and engineering drawings, and we went 
was stuck with just the building industry. Uh, and the most important thing is that it had, at, the GDS system had access to long-term design databases, very, very important, and they were large. They were large at the time, and they're still, they still are. In order to do this, I had some really great programmers. And they, they set up a, a, an infrastructure software <coughs> which dealt with um, the programming systems, which meant that in this then very restricted Fortran environment, uh, we got program paging organized and, and so on and so forth. And the user interfaces, we delighted in X, Y, and Z commands of different classes of commands, uh, with many use graphics, command rollback, and that sort of thing. And then also, very important, the interaction with these large, large databases, which other CAD systems at the time were not, were, you actually waited long times to get, to get things out of. But uh, the Boston infrastructure meant that it was very responsive. So, GS actually owned a lot to the original VDS exercise. We could make the complex data structures we needed. Uh, we had things that we called intelligent objects because they, they had unlimited graphics, unlimited text, unlimited uh, abstract data. Uh, and uh, we weren't using layers in drawings to select what to draw. We were using groups and associated groups of objects, uh, which was much, much more flexible. And also, uh, from, oh, sorry, back up. Uh, we had <coughs> any, any existing drawing, any existing object, we used, they reused again on, an, on, another, uh, on another drawing or, or so on. And, uh, And this is what a GPS object looked like. It was an index, a reference, its position, orientation, and scale, and then a name which was, could be truncated, but was, could potentially be very long. Uh, <coughs> and then it had graphics in it, text in it, and the non-graphical non data. The non-graphical data was, was very important. So, they say we, we used selection of objects rather than layering. Uh, we could, <coughs> we had very powerful editing, so you could either edit a single thing or you could edit ranges of them in, in, in one fell swoop. And uh, un, virtually unlimited drawing size, whereas other competitors had very real limitations. Oh, we also, because of a man called Malcolm Sabin, I don't know whether he is still alive or not, he's much older than me, so I guess he may not be. He suggested to us, why don't you do a, uh, a drafting system which doesn't have straight lines? That sounds a bit daft, doesn't it? Uh, but it turned out to be very clever. The description of the line <coughs> in GGS was a start point, an end point, and a bulge. So every line was potentially an arc. Uh, if, the, if B was zero, it was a straight line. But that gave, uh, gave the ability to create not just straight lines, which most graphic systems were doing at the time, but combinations of them and closed blocks, uh, open lines, closed blocks, and so on and so forth. And they could be indefinitely sized. Uh, And we had, as I say, very good light, very good graphics. And we had, and this was the hit code that made the geometry in GDS very, very effective. And I'll just go through them. There's ten of them. Uh, just point, point anywhere. Uh, P is a point, an intersection in the graphics. O is the origin of the object. Line is a point, any point on a line. 
t is tangential to any curve, c is the center of any circle or arc, uh, m is the midpoint of a line, n is normal to, uh, on a line normal to something else, on a grid, or locked on to uh, graphics. So this actually meant that you could uh, use one command and, and adjust it as you used it so that it would, um, it, it would be very interactive and very fast and would do automatic, very complicated constructions with, without even thinking about it. And uh, <coughs> from SBT, one of our first clients, there, there you can see a sort of combination of various line styles, character styles, uh, a few objects, north point, yeah, a food trolley, etc. But this was pretty novel sophistication in the CAD world at that time. Uh, it was really quite remarkable. So you could develop line styles, and these are, oh, as usual, it's uh, line styles for sewage. <laughs> in the GDS library. And you could develop your own character sets, so Masanori dutifully put, I think, about 6,000 Japanese characters in the system. He was a great guy. And it had, obviously, all sorts of uh, libraries of, of uh, these, are, these are steel sections and bits of duct work. And this is what the configuration of a GDS system looked like. And there's one in Pasadena. And these are a few drawings. This, is, this was uh, Paul's original test drawing. Uh, and uh, what did he do with this? And this was Matsunori's test drawing for Japan. This is the Martin Center, actually, the Martin Place company, right, in Sydney. And, and, and this is the sort of level of detail you can get in the drawings. This drawing is the first ever drawing exhibited at the Royal Academy, the first ever computer drawing exhibited at the Royal Academy by our clients, Scott Parrish and Tony. And these are just assorted details. So it drew anything that you wanted to draw. Then we started getting a bit, a bit more interested again in 3D, so we got pin line drawings. And they got quite good. And that must have been about, that must have been about 80, 80 or something like that. And, and, and this one, this was done by John Hare and Bill Hare. And then we got colour. <coughs> and uh, it started to go quite, quite mad with the model. It was very simple modeling to do, but it was getting pretty effective. And I just want to go through three projects which are, I think are interesting. They're particularly interesting from the, the BIM history. But, but that's almost another story. We sold our first two systems um, to a firm of architects called Scott Browning and Turner. One was in London in Covent Garden and the other one was in Guildford. Uh, and they had the job of designing a new terminal for it. Um, about, our, about two years after we sold it to them, the, the managing partner turned around to me and said, you know your system was really expensive. And indeed it was, it was half a million pounds. He said, but if we hadn't got it, we'd be a year and a half late by now. And that, that was the real difference. Uh, <coughs> uh, the interesting thing about SBT is they used to set their computer going in with a big, big wide uh, uh, what's it called? Um, matrix printer and set it going in the evening when they went home and they'd end up with 20 or 30 beautiful A, A0 drawings on the floor. And uh, they, 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 it was spectacular what they could do. But uh, after that, GDS got used very successfully on, on a lot of major projects, particularly air, air, airplane projects. And Charles de Gaulle and uh, Munich, I think, are two of them. And this is, this is the drawing from Scott Browning and Turner. And it just 
show the level of detail from this corner to here, down to here, all the detail up and dimension and so on and so forth. There we go. <coughs> the system for the big league in Boston, which uh, was used right up until the year 2000 or so, and then they, then they changed the systems to an American system, of course. <coughs> but it did quite well, and this is some of their drawings. And this was, I think, although it's unarchitectural, and it was a, it's a sold and so they had to have a cap an assessment of the capital, a detailed assessment of the capital value of their installations. And so our friends in Australia uh, put together a system um, which basically covered three million square miles, about about ten million telephone lines, um, <coughs> and it would it covered the whole of Australia from the telephone exchange down to the plug in the wall in, in everybody's house. And that, that was pretty spectacular. And it was quite big. It had about 800 workstations in, in seven different districts. Very boring drawings they produced, though. Uh, but these are some of them. So, by 1983, we got a really tr truly effective CAD. Uh, system of this object intelligence. Good actually that by then 3D visualization, uh, a non graphical database, which uh, sadly didn't go anywhere, uh, and very good customization. But having had the problem of trying to sell it, people would turn to say, turn around and say, well you only do drawings, you don't you haven't got a model. And uh, that was a for many people, a critical, apparently a critical criteria. Uh, so we, we built a hugely uh, sophisticated three-dimensional model, which we couldn't sell to people because it's too complicated. Uh, and uh, so we started to create a whole range of different models uh, associated with GPS uh, for architectural And uh, so we had reinforced concrete detailing, building services, space planning systems, solid modeling to create the three-dimensional object to, pla to place it in, in, in space, and a three-dimensional parts assembler uh, to do that. Too. Put together all the uh, <coughs> all, all the different three-dimensional models, ground modeling, area mapping, management for large-scale mapping. And we had this EOS database, which was, I think, as advanced as Oracle was at the time. So, we were doing quite well for a little company. Uh, and, and people began to understand that it was really, really was industrial strength, scalable, and, and solid, and fail safe. <coughs> What did we get wrong? Well, after our rather bloody experience with BDS, uh, we, for a while, we.
1985, the company was sold to, uh, to McDonald Douglas. They stopped developing a PC version. Uh, PC versions, rip-offs actually, called Micro GS, were actually made using very much the same technology. And uh, a spin -off, another spin-off company called, called Cacol uh, built a very, very successful, and it's still, still going strong, uh, GIS system using many of the same techniques. So, uh, I was phenomenally fortunate in the people we had. I, I don't know why. Uh, maybe I was just lucky. But we had some great people, and we really did have technology to compete with uh, the the, uh, the the real big boys in America. Technically, technically, not marketing wise, but technically. Uh, and I sort of asked myself, what didn't we have? Basically, what we didn't have was the, um, an American scale market. These, oh sorry. These guys all started in America, and they had the American market to, 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 to work in. We had some real successes in America, but we weren't there. And if we put this bunch of talent together on the West Coast or the East Coast of America, I think that uh, we'd all be much, much richer than we are. <laughs> However, so the question is, what was it wrong that we were not based in America? I think probably, maybe we were in the wrong place. Thank you. question, to what yeah. extent, particularly in the early days, but, to what extent in the early days did the, the, the kind of modeling that you were doing, to what extent did that take advantage of, for example, the work that Lionel and Phil were doing oh, yeah. on building descriptions, yeah. shape, geometries? And uh, uh, there was a conference, Janet was all about it. Uh, did you organize it, Janet? The, in Pembroke, of which one? Uh, and there, that, that was all about building descriptions and so on, and a lot of, lot of papers were there. But the seminal one for putting together big uh, oxes <coughs> was the one that, in the paper that Paul wrote for that conference. 
But was Paul then <laughs> using the work that Lionel and Phil uh, had done? Uh, You'd have to ask. Paul, Paul, Paul's Paul. mind is, is, is a mind of its own, which is, uh, I don't know, is the answer to that. But he, he put together the uh, codification of <coughs> geometric relationships in this three dimensional orthogonal world. And how, and that basically meant that he had, he had the mechanisms to do detection and so on so in, 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 in that rather simple world. Yeah. Now, frankly, it's not right, but uh, I don't, I, I think we just had to go plow our own furrow a bit. Yes, no, it's interesting with the work, particularly the early work in love, yeah, 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 yeah. which was, I mean, fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. describing the attributes of buildings yeah. in systematic ways, yeah. that that should have been going on, yeah. and that but the overlap with your work should have been so relatively... Much easy. less than I thought it would be. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of overlap with Dean's work, though, <coughs> because for, for all, all the environmental models, and uh, that, that really was important. When Janet... Sorry. Sorry. No, 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 I'm talking. <coughs> saying he was cursing about it only today, weren't you? <laughs> Sorry? Hit codes. Hit. The lack of hit codes in Australia. The hit codes were really magic, weren't they? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and also the drawing quality was really magic. Because the other drawing systems, Intergraph, uh, <coughs> uh, what was it, computer vision and so on, they produced very, very crude uh, and very simple-minded drawings. And they didn't have the concept that you could have a line that went on and on and on, like the graphics blocks in, in, the, in, in, in GDS. Sorry. How much do you think the development of computers uh, diverged the style and architecture? Sorry, I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm a bit deaf. How yeah. much do you think the development of computers formed the style of architecture in the last couple of years? Uh, well, I, I think the style of architecture, when we were doing it, was pretty mundane. It wasn't true art. You know, these building systems didn't produce beautiful buildings. They Actually, I could have shown you some really horrible ones. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the, the, I'm not proud we were ever involved with. But uh, it, it, they were still pretty, pretty much oriented towards functionality and functionality and functionality and that was it. Uh, 
up to them to dress up the outside the way they wanted, but you know, it, it was the function of matter. Uh, and uh, I think, think it's moved on since then. But so you were working with an architect on this early Oscar work. Oh yeah. So who was the architect? Uh, well, the, they, they helped the project up. Yeah, they helped. It was a chap called Martin Jones, mm -hmm. <coughs> and he was uh, he was the deputy chief architect of the Fox Regional Health Authority, and he was and he is the guy that employed Paul in, when he was working as the as a as an architect in the East Anglian Regional Health Authority. <coughs> So, but actually, just that work that Paul did that summer, not for us, but for the Regional Health Authority in Oxford, as a, as a, Paul was unbelievably productive when he got going. Uh, and, uh, <laughs>
Thank you.